our conversation. So if you are not able to hear us, we can always circulate the microphone and uh, otherwise uh, we'll make an attempt to speak uh, loudly so that everyone can hear us. Um, my name is Steve Torres. I'm a member of, o of the OYAS faculty, Office of Latino Latin American Studies, as well as the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And uh, today we have a wonderful presentation. But before we begin, we need to uh, extend our thank you to the Union of Contemporary Art for hosting this. I think we will round it up. Also, but very briefly, I also want to thank the Office of Latino Latin American Studies as well, and the Latinx Art Committee, uh, who put in a lot of work in coordinating all of this series of events. Uh, before we get started, uh, Adrian Duran gave me a quick announcement, and that is a 2019 Dia de los Muertos exhibit. We're going to have calaca skeletons and sugar skulls, right? It's going to be at an Alamo restaurant at 4917 South 24th Street. That'll be the opening reception will take place on Saturday, October 19th from 5 to 8. And then we also have Friday, October 25th, November 1st from 5 to 8, and Saturday, October 26th, and November 2nd to 12 from 1 to 8 p.m. The closing reception will be on Saturday, November 2nd from 5 to 8, in case anyone is interested. Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to do a very uh, I don't know if it's going to be quick, but we'll try to make it quick. Presentation of all of our panelists. We have a very distinguished uh, panel here. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, for me to have the opportunity to moderate uh, this discussion. You don't have to read that whole bio. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, uh, just very briefly, Karen Campbell is the Phil Wilson Curator of Contemporary Art at the Johnson Art Museum. And since joining the museum in 2012, she has curated several major exhibitions, including 30 Americans, wordplay, prints, photographs, and paintings by Ed Roche, and Sheila Hicks, Material Voices. She also oversees Jocelyn's collection of post-war and contemporary art, and is a principal curator for the Karen and Doug Wright Contemporary Artist Project, Project Gallery, uh, the first space in the museum's history dedicated specifically to living artists. Campbell completed her BA in art history and political science, College of the Holy Cross, and uh, she, she also completed her, her MA in Curatorial Studies from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Art College and the Dale Hudson in New York in 2011. From 06 to 09, she served as a curatorial assistant in the Contemporary Art Department at Carnegie Museum of Art Pittsburgh, where she helped organize Life on Mars, the 55th Carnegie International. And before moving to Omaha, Campbell curated the 2011-2012 installment of Espai Trece, an annual exhibition series at the Fundacio Joan Miro in Barcelona. Thank you. Next, we have Adrian Duran from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Adrian Duran was born and raised in New Jersey. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from the University of Notre Dame and received an MA and PhD in Art History from the University of Delaware. Duran is a specialist in modern and contemporary art, particularly Italian modernism, and teaches courses on 19th, 20th, and 21st century art, art theory, and criticism. Prior to arriving at UNO, Duran taught at the Memphis College of Art. Dr. Duran's research focuses on mid 20th century painting and sculpture in Italy, particularly in relation to the politics of the Cold War, as manifest in both art objects and the art critical discourse. He has also worked on issues of influence within international abstraction during the 1940s and 50s. His work also engages art criticism, recently focused on issues of regionalism and language in southern contemporary art, as well as the intersection of contemporary photography and new media practices. Sounds good. Okay, well, thank you so much, Adrian. Next, we have Nancy Friedman Sanchez. Uh, and Nancy earned her MFA from New York University. Having grown up in Colombia and having migrated to the U.S. as an adult, she makes art in two languages about the curious and intense experience of physically having moved, yet having a piece of her, uh, having remained rooted in Colombia. She's currently creating a visual novel comprised of paintings, sculptures, and mixed media that together and in different voices weave a synchronicity of dialogues, passages, punctuations, and silences about hybridity and cultural ownership. It is a multi-narrative novel about cultural memory, migration, and the pursuit of the American dream. Her work is anchored in the histories of the encounter between the Americas and Europe. 
informed also by feminism and minimalism, her art is inspired by North and South American cultural forms that fuse and cross-pollinate. Her practice is a bicultural and transcultural experience, and it speaks of difference and opposites. And finally, we have Carlos Tortolero. Carlos is the founder and president of the National Museum of Mexican Art, the NMMA, the NMMA in Chicago. He founded the museum in 1982, and the museum opened its doors in 87. From 75 to 87, Tortolero worked as a teacher, counselor, and administrator in the Chicago public school system. He earned his BA in secondary education and history from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and an MA in bilingual education supervision from Chicago State University. Tortolero has written for several books, as well as numerous articles for national and international publications. He has also made presentations across the U.S. and in Mexico, Puerto Rico, France, Spain, Sweden, and in Argentina. He has also served on several national research or search committees, rather, including the Smithsonian American Museum of Art director position in 2016 and 17. And he has taught classes at University of Illinois at Chicago, the School of the Art Institute, and Northwestern University. I'm going to read those two quickly, yeah, okay. things aligned, so we can get to our panel discussion here. So I have a series of questions that were prepared by the committee that helped organize this event. And we're going to begin our, our, our panel with a series of personalized questions that the members of the committee uh, wanted to ask each individual member. And then after that, we're going to open up our panel to a round table where the questions will be addressed to, to the entire panel. And we will just have a more informal discussion. And after all of this, we will open it up to any questions that we might have from the audience. So our, our first list of questions here are for Karen Campbell. The first one is, what is a place for Latinx art in a metropolitan museum, such as the Dawson Art Museum, in your estimation? Great. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, I think, an important first place to start. Um, and I kind of want to broaden the perspective a little bit before we think about Omaha specifically, think about some other uh, initiatives at standard bearer institutions across the country, because we're really kind of in a moment of reckoning right now. Um, I think about the saying, this is a movement, not a moment. Um, has anyone seen Hamilton? No? Yeah, I'm going tomorrow night. I'm really excited about it. It's in the play. Anyway, um, so but this idea that this is an ongoing thing. This is not something that we are dealing with right now, and then we're going to close this chapter and move on to something else. Um, so we're looking at institutions like the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, which has completely deinstalled its spaces, built out some new galleries, actually a lot of new galleries. Um, and they are, for the first time, presenting art really in the way that actually Alton Barr, the founder, was, was thinking about it, which is this really broad understanding of what constitutes art in the current moment. Um, so in addition to bringing things out that have never been shown before, um, they're really working on diversifying the perspectives and not having this sort of, um, well, this, this white and Eurocentric perspective on the history of art anymore. Um, they're learning that it needs to be many more things. So, you know, uh, institutions like MoMA, um, Pacific Standard Time in Los Angeles, they're now in three um, iterations of this exhibition. The most recent one was at the end of 2017 and 18, and it focused specifically on Latinx arts. So there's something like 70 cultural organizations across the city that had exhibitions, pop-ups, um, Philharmonic did a whole concert series, so it was this really kind of immersive experience. Um, so, so the point of talking about this is that we have a lot of these bigger, very well-funded institutions that the art world pays attention to, finally standing up and helping to set the stage for these conversations to filter down to, to other organizations and places like Omaha, where we need to be having these conversations um, increasingly. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the very simple answer, uh, so I've kind of taken a long time to get there, is that um, oh, Jaws and Art Museum is a step behind the times, and we have been grappling with this um, for about a decade now, uh, and we're taking um, we're taking steps in the right direction, in my estimation. So, um, when I got to the Jocelyn, which was seven years ago, I looked around and said, oh my god, it is so white and so male here. Um, how do we make the collection look more like what America looks like? How do we make the collection and our programming look more like what Omaha looks like? Um, and this is before I even kind of understood this city. Like, I think I'm learning more about it all the time, but seven years ago, I was like a fish out of water here. I had no idea what the kind of um, cultural landscape of the city was. And so, you know, there, there, are, there are multiple ways that we can come at this, and I know that I'm gonna try and not spoil or run into the other questions you have for me, but, um, but it needs to really come through several prongs. Um, first of all, we need to think about it through exhibition programming. 
Um, and that is something that I am working on through the, our project gallery. You mentioned the, the Karen Dobrell Lake and Prairie Artists Project Gallery. Um, it's the first space we've ever had dedicated specifically to living artists, and it's the only space we have where we can act with some sense of urgency. So we're not planning exhibitions years out, we're planning exhibitions like a year out. Um, and it's, I've been thinking about it as sort of the laboratory where we can start to have conversations um, that people are more uncomfortable with, um, things we haven't thought about through as an institution before. Um, and so I, I have, don't have 20, 2021 and 2022 programmed yet, but I will say stay tuned um, because uh, I've been looking at a couple of Latinx artists specifically for the next couple of years, and I'm really thrilled about what they are going to bring to the table. Uh, I made a studio visit with one just a couple of weeks ago, and it, it blew my mind. Um, so I know that's sort of like an unsatisfying <laughs> answer to that part of the question. Um, so it's exhibitions, it's collection. Um, we have a, a few great examples of work by artists who are Latinx, but we certainly don't have a broad collection. Um, to be very honest, I don't know that we will ever have a broad collection. It is, um, it takes money, it takes resources, it, it takes very dedicated patrons. We have all of those things to a degree, um, but we are also an encyclopedic institution, right? So we have to think across history, and across media, and across perspectives, um, but we still can build out in that way. Uh, and then finally, it's staffing. Um, right now, we have one full-time staff member who is a native Spanish speaker. Um, and we have other part-time staffers and um, volunteers and whatnot, but um, we need to be thinking about bringing more people on board who are reflective of um, a certain set of, of experiences um, and we know all these things. Uh, and then doing them is the next step. So it's, it's like G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle, and then you have to, to do the other half. You know, you already pretty much they answered all the questions. <laughs> yes, they're all done. So next, no. <laughs> but very quickly, though, uh, uh, you know, you answered a lot of the, the following question that so the, the committee had prepared mm -hmm. for you, uh, which has to do with you know the, the different initiatives yep. that the Johnson has in mind for the future. One of the questions uh, that came from the committee had, had to do with uh, the Johnson's involvement with the University of Nebraska sure. at Omaha and how that collaboration. Uh, can produce you know productive initiatives as well. I saw Dr. Garcia in the audience here, and I know that Dr. Tokaymata Hatch has also been involved in some of the initiatives. Is there anything that you could share with the audience yeah. along those lines that might be interesting? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, I sat down with our director of education and outreach because she knows more about all of the things um, in terms of programming than I do. And I was and my eyes were kind of the size of dinner plates when she handed over this piece of paper to me, which has. Um, more things than I probably have time to talk about right now, but there have been at least four service learning projects between UNO and Jaws and Art Museum in, in recent years. Um, one was a gallery guide called Finding Hispanic Voices. Um, so that there are sort of in-gallery things, there are teacher resources, there are community-based programs, and then there's sort of all these miscellaneous things that happen throughout the year. Um, so we also did uh, a service learning project for teachers through the Foreign Languages and Literature Department at UNO. This is an annual thing. Um, there is, uh, sorry, I have to use my, my notes on this because I sure, sure. some of these are working on all but um, the Hispanic Cultural Festival, uh, it's a biannual celebration. Uh, so that's forthcoming in April 2020. It'll be music, dance, food, gallery activities, art making. Um, and then the gallery conversations in Spanish. It's an occasional offering from what I understand, uh, but it's also a service learning project um, for the Intercultural, Intercultural Senior Center in South Omaha. Uh, that's kind of the community at large. And so, um, trying to engage different communities through as many um, means as possible. Um, and, and that's part of what an institution like Jocelyn has to do. You realize you have a varied audience and people are coming to the table with different experiences, interests, education levels, abilities, you know, um, languages, it's sort of across the board. And so you have to come at people and kind of give them every opportunity to, um, to walk through the door. Um, and if, if you're interested, I don't, I'm not going to go through every single program, but if you guys want to know more at some point, I'm happy to tell you more about the, those programs. Excellent. You mentioned language was one of the factors in reaching out to a broader audience. You know, when we think of the U.S. population, we don't always remember that there are 52 million Spanish speakers in the U.S. There are more Spanish speakers in the U.S. than there are in Spain. That's a lot of Spanish speakers in this country. Yeah, we don't always see Spanish that often. And I know you mentioned some of the uh, programs that we developed in conjunction with UNO, including the Foreign Languages and Literature Department. 
And I'm wondering if bilingualism is something that maybe you intend to expand or further develop at the, at the Jocelyn Art Museum. I know some members of the committee but were thinking, well, for instance, has the Jocelyn considered having a bilingual a wall prints and so forth, yeah. explanations of moving further in that direction? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we do have some labels that are, are in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, our audio guides for our temporary exhibitions are always on full, offered in both English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that I would like us to market more. I don't think people know about it as much. Um, just the audio guide in general are really good um, mediation tools for an exhibition. Um, you know, to have two labels up for every single object uh, gets a bit difficult and cumbersome. Um, you know, I, I could foresee in the future doing more, especially once we have a new building. Uh, as you know, we are expanding. We're going to have more real estate. Um, which is also overdue. Uh, so, you know, there, I think there's gonna be a lot that comes along um, with that growth. Uh, do I foresee putting up two, uh, two languages for every single wall label? I don't. Um, I just, it's it's not something um, that I think we can accommodate. Um, we don't have the staffing for it currently. Um, and it, it starts to look really messy in the galleries. Um, so it's an aesthetic concern. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a multi, so sort of a multi concern. Um, but, you know, we, there are opportunities for Spanish speakers who don't have um, many English language um, skills to, to engage with content. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, last but not least, uh, I addressed many of the questions. I think that the, uh, that's it for the prepared. But I'm wondering, uh, in terms of inclusivity, mm -hmm. what could the temporary art community do, and specifically the museums, mm -hmm. any other things that could be done to be more inclusive? Any other things that come to mind? I mean, you Perpet perpetually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, you know, it, uh, for me, part of it is awareness that it's, it's, a, it's a constantly shifting thing, um, that we have to keep going back to the core of the problem or the core of the, the concern and being willing to come up with new solutions all the time, all the time to address things. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like I did kind of dive into this with my first very windy answer. Um, but, you know, the community writ large, um, it's, it's being willing to, to rewrite a history that is sort of stuck in its ways. And maybe Adrian can talk a little bit about, you know, how art history tends to be kind of a staid field, especially if there's something that's been researched to death. It tends to stay that way, um, and we think that we can't unearth kind of new narratives. But if if the if MoMA's rehanging of its collection can tell us anything, it's that it is possible in 2019 and, and onward to write a new history and to rethink what, especially what American art means. There's no kind of monolithic understanding of American art anymore. Well, thank you so much, Karen. I'm sure we'll be continuing our discussion as we have the open round table. We're going to move on to Carlos Tortorero. And uh, an important question here uh, for you, considering that you're the founder of this prestigious museum in Chicago, is what struggles did you encounter in founding this museum? What were some of the, the obstacles, struggles that you encountered way back in the day? When... It's the same ones I'm encountering today. Huh? One, you know, quality. They never asked a large white institution quality. But an institution of color, quality always comes out. Wow. Always. Wow. So that's still there. Not just from an institution of color. But that's an issue today. That's just being real. The second is from mm -hmm. Still, it's still funny. When a large white art institution begins to do things of person of color, they get all the money. Whether institutions who years are, are trying to get money, there's no money for them. I honestly think, and I said this publicly, I don't think large white institutions should be giving all this foundation money to change institution. They should be changing because it's the right thing to do. In other words, you misbehave and you could reward it? I mean, that's kind of absurd when you think about it. I remember there was a foundation years ago, and you know, this person was a friend of mine. We always just got $5,000 from them, right? So we have lunch, and she says, apply for this, apply for that, but don't not apply for outreach money. All right, good. Even though a lot of people in Chicago, they come to us, you know, you know how to reach community. So I get their annual report. Annual reports are wonderful. If you want to do any kind of not-for-profit organization, read annual reports. Those are the Bibles. When they say that we don't fund this, well, yes, you do. <laughs> so they're very important. And uh, so anyway, I see that, th that they give about 25 outreach grants by $25,000. And we're just going to get five. Now those 25, 17 that come talk to us how to do it. 
So I call her up and tell her friend, she immediately laughed because she knows where I'm going with this So we can't get outreach money. No, you can't. But you do give out your, uh, you know, you know, your outreach money. Yeah, we do. So why can't we get out, you know, you know, your outreach money? Because you're too good at what you do. I said, you know, I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna say, the next white couple, black couple, Native American with a baseball bat, with a, someone might say, video camera, I went with a baseball bat and said, man, I'm all messed up, I need six figures. <laughs> it's absurd, it's obscene. In other words, you behave badly, then you get the reward, and you have to reward for, you know, for the work you do. So those two channels are always there. And, and the funny thing is still there because, you know, our institutions are so important in our community. You know, we do more than our institutions. We do, we do. And in Chicago, for example, when I was a kid, all the museums were free. We go to, now they're 20, 25 dollars. Did that park downtown, right? 56 dollars for two hours. How do our mom and daddy get to right. these institutions? Give me a break. Yeah. So if you really want to get, you know, reach out to people, then reach out to them in the correct way for us. Right. And free days. Try to figure out the free days in Chicago. Oh my God, you have to, you know, you know a mathematician like Tamayas. Figure out one of the free days. It's done purposely to say you have it, but not wanting people to come. It's a game and it's racism. And right. We need to talk about racism more and more. You know, I remember, because right now, Smith, you get the word uh, inclusiveness and diversity. We never talk about racism. Right, and that's right, the bottom right, line. Yeah, that's you know, it's called Alcoholics Anonymous, now they have a problem, Anonymous. You have to name the problem. Right. And the problem is racism. And you don't see people talk about it because it gets them uncomfortable. Well, you know, when the person has an alcohol problem, that's been uncomfortable. But you hear she wants to change. And you want to change this country, you can be open. That's why in the present we have a problem. We have to deal with this and be open about it. And we're not, you know, we're so our institution wants to change, we have to talk about racism. And then I think the word racism, I'm like, whoa, 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 it's not gonna happen. Right. You mentioned racism, and you also implicitly mentioned classism here, right? Kind of a, a de democratization of the dissemination of cultural capital so that you have opportunity hoarding. Some people have museums that they can go to, and other segments of society can't afford it because of the combination of issues of race and class. I'm wondering along those lines. Uh, how did you go about, uh, uh, how, did, how did you find the funding to get you? Well, school? number one, I'm not shy. <laughs> and number two, I have a joke that says, if you walk by and I pick you up and throw you up, when you need to grab whatever falls, it's mine, okay? I'm gonna get the funding, I'm just kidding. No, we always argue with funders quality. You know, before you even mention it, I throw them to face. You know, we do this, we get this, we get awards, boom, boom, let's get that out of Okay, our community, by so much products in this country. Think about it, you know, how much money, so they're giving our money away to somebody else. It's crazy, we should get a first share. There's still too much foundation giving and corporate giving where the chairman of the board plays golf with, you know, with well, let's say chairman of our organization, they decided to give a half a million dollars. No proposal, nothing, then with us, we've got guidelines and on page four, A, B, you can answer this question. It's an answer, they don't want to give you the money. That needs to change. It's our money. I mean, you know, we're spending it for God's sake. We have to get some of it back. I just think it's good business. Right. But they didn't seem like doing you a favor. It's charity. That gets them upset. They're not a poverty program. We give you money, get money back to us. That simple. Right. You know, you mentioned this. It made me think of an old expression that the chieftains in Spain in the 19th century used to have. They used to say, para el amigo, el favor. For your friend, the favor. Para el enemigo, la ley. For your enemy, the law, all right? So yeah, no, there's, two rules. there's two rules. And, <laughs> and, yeah, two sets of rules, what you're describing. Um, so if uh, you, know, you had to go back in time, I think when you started out at the museum, is there anything you would do differently? Not really. And I think I thought about this a lot last night. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, no, I think it turned out the way I wanted it to turn out. Yes. I wish there'd been a lot less fighting. <laughs> I think, I think, I know, you know, it's wishing to be more change by this time. No, my tragedy from day one was to do a museum in a working class neighborhood, to do an art museum, and to be free. And most of the arts world thought I was crazy. By the way, I did it last night with three of these panels, and somebody else, lovely people. Everybody's been real nice because they want to go to them. Thank you. I mean, you really made me feel welcome. Thank you very much. But I think it's, it's, it's important that, you know, we understand who's in the community more and more. And when I first did the museum, no one arts, I mean, very few in the arts world thought I was going to do that. And that was to me a shock that I was the arts world. You know, you know, you're the dreamers, man. Mm -hmm. You have to believe in us. But, you know, do something different. I still think today a problem with a lot of people is 
They don't understand institutions like us. They see it as some kind of some weird civil rights project or mm -hmm. some affirmative action program or something. Right, right, right. They don't see it as we have great culture. Latin America has over 20 countries, each of them with beautiful culture that need to be preserved and shown and appreciated. You know, second to none. So I think it's important that, you know, we have organizations like this and they should be funded adequately. You know, our art collection now, we have over $10,000 in object, or 10,000 copies of art. It's hard to pay for this stuff. It really is. I should mention one of the things that happened early on that I didn't know about is Chicago has a museum fund, which if you're a museum on park property, you shouldn't have property tax. We're up to $1.4 million a year now from that fund. We didn't start that way. After, like every three years, but we're doing it again this year. We go in the room, beat each other up, I become the bad guy, but I get more money. It's not a popularity contest, but they need the fresh air. But I knew that, and so I made sure we got our building, it would be in the park. And we wanted to be in the maternity, we wanted to be in a working class community. So there are people saying, you know, you know, you're too good to be, they said, you're too good to be in the neighborhood. What the hell does that mean? Right? Why does everything good have to be downtown? Right? And so, which is why I'm very supportive of institutions that are starting out throughout the country who are based on one culture, because I think it's important that we support them. Every community should have something about the arts. It shouldn't be, you know, we're the city that have, you know, Hall House. You know, the, you know, the famous place for social uh, events, you know, way back for Jane Adams. And I think every, you know, every city should have throughout the area where arts are made. It shouldn't be for the rich, it shouldn't be educated, can it just, you know, should be just for white people, it should be for everybody. I think the arts are an essential component of being a human being. And now, I've been saying this about 10 years, now more people are saying it, the arts are essential to democracy. And I said that 10 years ago, people thought I was crazy. Now they get it, now they see what I'm talking about. Free speech is important, and the arts are part of that. They need to be funded at higher levels. So, well, you know, uh, you come from Chicago, and you're talking about problems that you have a big city like Chicago, and here in Omaha, we've been pretty fortunate. We have a Museo Latino, we have initiatives such as, you know, where we're at right uh, today, and so forth. So for a city of this size, but there's still lots of communities across the country that don't have uh, Museo Latinos and so forth. And uh, what advice would you give people in other parts of the country if they want to go about starting uh, a museum along these lines? And thinking about, you know, you talk about uh, talking back, confronting the powers that be, public interventions such as this one, raising awareness. What other strategies are there? What advice would you give uh, to, to people in other communities who would like to emulate this project? You know, one of the things I did, because I'm a history person, more than an arts person, I traveled all around the country and saw what other people were doing. And thought, you know, this could work, and that would work. You know, so I learned from that. Yeah. That's very important. I think it's important to go out. I also think it's important for people, if someone says no, to go out and go, you know, you have the dream. I mean, very few people thought I could do it. So when we have artists who come, he said, we saw you work and I included in the show, and I always tell them, you should think we're crazy and continue doing your, your stuff. If you believe in yourselves, I'm not the final judge, we're not the final judge. If you have a dream, go for it. Even if a thousand people say no to you. Maybe a thousand one person would say yes to you. You have to keep plugging away, keep believing in yourself, and then, you know, don't let anybody stop you. If you really believe in your stuff, I think right. that's, that's important, very important, and the persistence. One more question that no came problem. out of the community. This one came from you know, some of the artists, and they were wondering, you know, uh, what does the National Museum of Mexican Art do to stay connected with the Latinx art community? Uh, the, you know, the community that you we, you know, for for local artists, we're based on Cultural Mexico, that's what we're based on. Those who work with the Latin groups, um, we have a gallery just for Chicago artists. I, I want to say this. I say, look, every time I go into the city, I think it's obscene, wrong that if you are artists and you pay taxes and the, and the museum in that town, town does not have a local gallery for you, I think that's bad. Mm -hmm. Every large, every city, there should be a dedicated space for local artists. Right. Why do artists have to be dead to become important? Because I think the art world is afraid to pick somebody who's hot now yeah. and 20 years old, oh my God, we give him an exhibition, everybody says he sucks, oh my God, what do we do? Mm -hmm. the, world, art, the art world is not as open as people think it is. Time can be very fascist. It really can. And I think that there's a need for us to have local space for our local artists. And we do that. So we're very important. And I've said last night to people, if we made a mistake, maybe, maybe showing the local artists maybe too much instead of doing less. 
But I, will, I would rather err on the side of doing more than I'm doing less. But I think it's very important to help them out. And you know, we help them out with grant writing. I've helped them get grants. I now make them for awards. I can track them. You know, they act, many times we act like we're a foundation. They come to us and, hi, how are you? need some money. We can always help out, but we try to help out as much as possible. Right? You mentioned what museums can do, but how about the artists themselves? What can the artists themselves do, to, uh, especially those that would like to see the work included at the exhibit? Uh, I, I said before, they should be tough and persistent. They should be knocking the way. I have to knock on doors to fund them. They should go to galleries. They should show their work. They should be out there. Well, you know, there are grants for local artists too, or artists, and I think they need to go out to investigate, go on the internet, see more grants as possible. And, you know, I think it's important to go to school because a lot of people, you know, you know, I don't think you have to go to art school to be an artist. I don't, but I know that piece of paper does help with a lot of people. It does. So the more prepared you are, the harder it is for them to say no to you. So I would say get as prepared as you possibly can. So open up, but you have to be, you know, go to art openings. Put yourself out there, make, you know, be, be a pain in the ass for God's sake, but be out there and try and get your stuff seen by as many people as possible. Be persistent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we're going to move on to Adrian Duran, and we're going to get a bit of an academic perspective now. Some of the committee members were curious as to how the curriculum has changed in recent years in light of the Latinx art, uh, uh, you know, their tendencies and so on. Has the curriculum changed? How so? Is it more inclusive now? What's happening in academia? Well, it depends on where you look. Um, I think the real fact that needs to be stated first is uh, that question requires context, right? The history of art as an academic discipline in this country is a post-World War II phenomenon. We're 70 years deep at the deepest, right? Um, a lot of that was formed by people emigrating from Europe, fleeing death, basically. Um, and that created a, a kind of critical mass of people, many of whom were in places like up and down the eastern seaboard in Chicago. Um, so we had sort of hot pockets of art historical inquiry going around. And over the last couple of decades, you know, the expansion of art history programs has been enormous. But the diversification of the curriculum has not been. And I think one of the things that, again, I think the blame needs to be put on history, right? Um, think about it like this. I went to graduate school in 1998. Um, the next year, uh, a friend of mine, or her colleague now, arrived, and she was the first woman of color to ever graduate from the University of Delaware with a PhD, and this was in 2010. So we're really late to the game. I don't know how else to say it. Um, Karen's, you know, Karen's right. We, we missed a couple of boats. We denied that the boats were there in many cases. And we have generated a discipline that's still very Eurocentric. Um, but it's tricky though, because one of the things that uh, is also happening is like right now, like Karen said, like, this is a hot moment. Um, the United States Latinx Art Forum was founded less than five years ago. Um, we finally have a scholarly group that puts us all under the same tent. Um, you know, the Latino Art Now Conference exists, which is a biannual, but is another, it's a simple saying, we didn't have places to congregate in the academic world that looked like the places we were used to congregating. Right, right. That meant we didn't improvise some days and make those spaces. But now that they're being formed, we finally have like a gravitational pull towards one another. It's been really productive. But I'll be damned if we're done. Right. Um, we still teach classes that privilege the Western canon. Um, we still, and, and this is, you know, this is a double-edged sword, right? Like we're in a really unique place here. We have playoffs, which is right, the only one in the region, correct? I mean, all the way to where? Like how far in either direction? Denver and Pittsburgh or something? Uh, yes. No, Denver and Chicago. Right. Okay. Chicago. So, but we're maybe the only player within a day's drive. So maybe that's an easy way to put it. Um, we've also got Jose de Latina, which is you know one of the first five of its kind in the country, despite its um, I would say lack of visibility even in Oman. It's still a fundamentally important institution for the development of this field, and so. Our problem is we haven't yet institutionalized the partnerships as well as we need to. Kevin's right too, it's about hiring, right? Um, UNO has really half-assed diversity initiatives when it comes to hiring. 
Most institutions and organizations. Yes, right. That's right. Not no, 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 it's not. We're, um, we're an example of the epidemic, I suppose. Right. Um, generating money for lines that attract high potential candidates doesn't exist. Academic higher education is moving towards contingent faculty, non tenure right. lines. We're not creating the opportunities we need to develop where we need to go. It's just like, um, how many times can you shoot yourself in the foot before you realize you're not walking? Right. And so I think that's part of it. But then the, the beauty of it, though, is that there is a lot of momentum right now. Um, uh, OIAS, you know, and, and this is something I learned. There's a woman called Jennifer Gonzalez who teaches in California. She wrote for an but She organized an anthology on Chicano and Chicano art right now. And she said something really important, I thought, at the, at the Latino Art Now conference. She said, I wasn't a Chicano until I was in my early 40s. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me because I feel kind of similar, you know, like um, I'm a good example of why I like the X and Latinx because it opens doors to involvement from people who may not otherwise feel themselves involved. And um, I think that, you know, Jennifer Gonzalez is maybe in some way our first example. The feeling has not yet matured to the point where it can declare itself to be what it actually is. And we're in this moment of sort of like, God willing, that self determination. Where we'll actually realize, like, no, 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 we're, we are these things already. We simply need to make them more visible than they already are because a lot of Latinx and Chicano art or, you know, Latin American, Central American art does show up in our curriculum. Don't be fooled. We're not in denial. We're just simply not as well lit as we need to be. Or we're not, we're organizing it by other terms, right? I teach a class called modern and contemporary, or I teach a class called contemporary art, mm -hmm. within which Latinx artists appear all the time. But because of its titling, we may not give the credit Separate. to where it's right. available. Right. Right. And like, I, don't, I certainly don't want applause we don't deserve, because we don't deserve a lot of it yet, but let's also not My deny opinion. the progress that we are making even incrementally to make it. So it sounds like you do think that faculty across the country are yeah. making greater efforts to yeah. have a more I mean, like, uh, Uslov now, like, every time the College Art Association annual meeting holds, they're guaranteed a panel. And so there's now a permanent spot for Latinx art within the broad College Art Association conversation. That didn't exist five years ago, so that's really good for us. Um, they have to hear from us now. Right, right. That's quite cool. Yeah, it's really interesting to see those inertial trends being questioned. Right. My own wife was an art history major. Really, she told me, you know, uh, uh, that when she was studying Latinx art, South American Central, like just nothing, just nothing. Right. So the fact that that's changed and is continuing right. to change in recent years is a, re a reforming trend in a yeah, positive right. direction. You also mentioned about hiring practices. We recently came to our attention that at UNO, the percentage of Latinx faculty is something in the river of 0.9%. So, 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 so that effect, and, and, and some of the faculty are in administrative positions, so they don't have a lot of contact with students. So even then, you know, so that's a, a really interesting factor that, that you bring up there. Uh, so, so students were also curious as to, I've just seen a difference in Latinx yeah. students in the last few years. How has that demographic changed? Yes. Have you seen any differences? Uh, oh yeah, it's lovely. Um, so I'm in year 14, right, of teaching higher ed, and um, that corresponds to two very different presidential administrations, mm -hmm. three very different presidential administrations, right? Um, I don't know, like one was sanity and a crazy white man <laughs> sandwich, you know? Um, <laughs> what we, uh, I, I think we've all seen, and this is what I really like, is I think the students, by which I mean like young people, anybody younger than I am, but myself included, like I'm Gen X, right? So we've had Gen Y, we've had millennials, we're on Gen Z right now. And despite the epidemic of dumping all over them, they're a hell of a lot better than we were. Um, their sense of social justice is stronger, their sense of engagement is stronger. They're, uh, I, I don't know how else to put it other than like, I'm Gen X, right? We're celebrated for our apathy. They're the language, they're celebrated for like getting all their friends into a, a, an online discussion and then like starting a protest the next morning. Um, it's motivating to be and be around those humans because they don't take the, they're really good at calling out BS when they see it and they're intolerant of those that don't help, which I really appreciate. And also they're coming at it like, no, I'm, I'm a person of color, I demand to have a curriculum. 
right, that that tends to there's a, a like a I don't mean grabby in a bad way, but grabby in a good way. Right? It's uh, only things were probably demanding to be solved. That's great. So, what are some of the problems that Latinx students face today, like in a predominantly white institution? What are some of those uh, problems that they might be, you know, compelled to protest or point out or signal or you know, engage in act, acts of activism and so forth? What are some of the problems that you that you've noticed? Well, the three easy ones are, um, although there's two of them are the same as the third. Um, obviously, we're the same community and funding. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know students of color in America right now are suffering from costs of higher ed in disproportionate ways that others are not. Um, that's a fact. Right. Um, we need to look at this. Is like our, we're, we're in the middle of a large discussion about should we or shouldn't we make education free? This is the answer why. Because all of a sudden it's accessible to all the humans who didn't have access to it previously, and it levels the playing field in ways that are very exciting. It forces us into interactions with each other in ways that you can't do otherwise. Right. And so um, we need to put money in people's pockets who don't have it, whether that's assisting with tuition or jobs on campus or just making the damn thing free. Um, I think the other thing that they lack is, you know, uh, is community. This is what White House is good for us, right? We have a clubhouse. That's it. That's it. Many campuses don't. And so everyone's dispersed across all the disciplines. And like, I have this lovely advantage um, where when I don't know things, I have colleagues to send my students to. I've got like, 30 people back up. And that's really luxurious. And so what we need to do is offer students in all institutions these kinds of bonding communities, cohorts, or whatever they call them these days. Uh, that truly is a luxury. It really is. It's been great, and you can see how tangibly impactful it is. Yes. Yes. So speaking of tangibly impactful, what would you say to a student that was thinking about studying art? What would you tell that student? You do it. Um, <laughs> I have to say, this is not really like a comic, like, I don't have to say it other than, and forgive me for saying this, I think this is a stupid question. Yeah. Um, I have no offense to whoever asked it. Um, stupid question, committee. Um, friends, don't let friends ask stupid questions. Um, and I say that because this question is born of our broader society, which is a society that's anti-intellectual, art-phobic, STEM-prone, and delusional about all. Um, I have made plenty of hay picking fights with my STEM colleagues. I just yesterday saw a great meme on the internet, you know. Um, for everybody who claims an art degree is worthless, how many logos have you seen today? How many cartoons did you watch as a child? How many museums did your kids go to on school trips? If the answer is any of them, shut up and sit down. Um, we all know good and well that the arts are an enormous part of this economy. We're $762 billion worth of the American economy. That's bigger than agriculture, it's bigger than transportation, and that's bigger than warehouse. Mm -hmm. I'm not at the back of the line, and I'm not going to be treated like some sort of interloper. Right. Um, our art students shouldn't either. This whole notion that what you're studying is worthless mm -hmm. is an indictment of the hierarchies we've built mm -hmm. for our society. It has nothing to do with the degree itself. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know what to say other than that's just a very stupid, ignorant set of <laughs> preconceptions that are perpetuated by stupid, ignorant preconceptions. And if we don't refuse to dignify that question, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah. Invalid question. That's <laughs> right, right, right. Well, but the answer actually is also with full steam ahead and blind optimism. Right. You know, being an artist is hard. It's harder than anything else. Um, the pre-med students can, you know, pipe down. Being an art student is hard as hell. Being an artist is hard as hell. So if you're going to do it, you need to be fanatical. You need to refuse no. You need to be willing to be poor. You need to be willing to move. You need to be willing to sleep on people's couches. You need to be willing to pay it forward when you get the opportunities. Right. right, right. Um, each one, teach one. Right. The Panthers got it right, and we just forgot. And I have another question for you. What has been the most impactful? Thing that's happened in your career. Moving a little bit ahead for the end here. So um, we have time to allow the movie chance to. No. Me and Karen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, you know, Karen, uh, Karen's probably more, more bright than she knows because um, I was at a small art college in Memphis, Tennessee before I moved here. And I was irritable because I didn't have the 
interdisciplinary possibility that I had in a place like the U.S. And I'm like totally being a home team supporter right now, right? I mean, the most impactful moment was when I sat down in my first art history class and then playing art with the Vinci Adoration of the Magi and scream and I realized like this is what I didn't really do, right? Um, the moment of revelation is the most important one. But then the moment where you can materialize that really happened best here, where it's like, like you know, you know we're, we're in the middle of, I don't know how many Art Day Latin Nights events right now. Um, there's been a half dozen this week at least. Um, it's also Human Rights Week at UNO, where we brought in artist Samuel Bach that had another week's worth of things. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of collaborative possibility and the realization that we're all in the same boat together and we don't all row in the same direction, the damn thing's just going to go in circles, was maybe the most important. It was the moment in which all my hunches were confirmed that we're only as good as we are together and alone we're not as good. It's like Jennifer Gonzalez said, I wasn't a Latinx art historian until I met you guys. <laughs> I wasn't. And now I'm like sitting here with this, I got three pages worth of bibliography for a soul because I'm building, all of which has come to me since April. You know, it's like, just try. But it'll work, it'll pay off. That, that's the answer. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay, Nancy, you're probably wondering, are they ever going to ask me any <laughs> questions? <laughs> but we are going to ask you questions. You, know, you, you occupy an interesting space within the field of cultural production, both as a producer and an academic as well, right? So uh, from an academic standpoint, uh, given your experience as a lecturer and also as a visiting art artist, how, how do you perceive the, the role of Latinx art today? Well, I, I guess I would put it in context, um, as I think I have um, embodied an identity of being Colombian, then Latina, then Latinx, and, and have had a history of, um, of teaching in institutions in Colombia, in institutions here, in studying here, in studying in Colombia. And I think at the, at the present, it's a, it's a very vital role that is becoming visible, um, also with all of the political events that, that are happening under this administration. I think it's, it's giving voice to, to, a, uh, to the artistic expressions of of Latino artists, Latinx artists. Mm. But I think parallel, there are other communities that are also, I mean, as an artist, I mean, shows with with other people, with Egyptian artists, with artists uh, from Asia. So I don't think that it is only a, a, a Latinx phenomenon. It's more or less, more or less global. So I think this is part part of a, of a bigger movement. Mm -hmm. the, and I think that that invisibility to more visibility, I mean, I remember my own my own studies. I mean, this is, I think, a whole <coughs> product of, of colonization, but I remember in Colombia going to art school and, and uh, studying either the kind of the local the local abstract artists that were looking at North American abstract expressionists, the local uh, minimalist, mil minimalists that were looking at North American art that mirroring, mirroring the North, <coughs> um, and then a reverence to a colonial past and some, and in, and in some more academic places, um, a reverence to uh, Colombian art. And um, I remember in grad school, in undergrad, because I think part of my undergrad in the US, there was no interest, which is what you were saying, no interest in, in, in Latin American art whatsoever. But then in the 90s, I was in grad school, I got invited to one of, uh, one of these Sotheby's auctions of, uh, of Latin American art. And I remember some people that seemed to be like Wall Street, like investors, art collectors, walking into the into the 
the Latin American um, space and just just openly completely say, oh, this has like this does not vibrate at all with with my aesthetic, <coughs> with my you know, with and I think that that kind of has changed and has opened up some, um, but there's a lot to, yeah, yes. From, from, yeah. you spoke a little yeah. bit about your, your experience in Colombia. I'm curious as to how your experience was transitioning to Nebraska <coughs> from Colombia, because that's quite a transition. Yes. Well, I first transitioned to New York. I did undergrad in, partly in, in LA, went back to Colombia, <coughs> then went to New York. And that transition was, in terms of education, it was a little bit better than my experience in LA in terms of open, openness. It was already ideas of multiculturalism and pluralism were discussed uh, very much. Um, um, there was a backlash on feminism. So in the 90s, people didn't want to talk about feminism. This was a one territory, one grounds. So it's all of the, this this push and pull between, um, you know, between gains and uh, and non gains. Um, what struggles have you encountered as a female artist? Boy, I think I think I have encountered. Struggles as a female Latin American artist, I would say, <coughs> it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint because I think getting excluded from exhibitions, uh, you don't get excluded because you're Latin American. It's either it doesn't fit the aesthetic of the moment, the trend, the so it's. You know, right? Yeah. So it's oblique. It's oblique. It's from the sides. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's a technical yes. explanation yes. for why yes. it didn't happen. I think that I have worked very hard at developing uh, a methodology to to enter to enter the system. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's more familiar with the system and with Latinx art, for instance, here in Nebraska, what is your overall? What do you think about that next art here in, in Nebraska? What is your impression? What do you think? What are your thoughts on the designs in terms of the uh, state of contemporary Latin X art today here in Nebraska? This is a question that the committee had for you because they thought, well, there's someone yeah. who's in the know and, and uh, who has you know, a lot of knowledge along these lines. So, um, what overall, what is your well, I think there there can be a um, there can be systems where artists get together and form coalitions to have either pop up exhibitions or critique groups or or discussions like this. That this is an opening to create that kind of that kind. Of, yeah, yeah. Do I see a cohesive movement? No, I yeah. don't. It's to perceive a fragmentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Let me ask a question. I know that it's um, maybe it would be useful for me and for other people, like some of the knowledgeable people on the in, on the panel, could help us um, better define the differences, similarities, and also the interconnections between what we call. Latino art, Latin American art, and Latinx, because there is a fluidity among the terms, and of course there is connections in terms of history, context, and so I will, if you could very briefly, and I know it's probably very difficult, but very briefly, kind of like uh, help us distinguish those? And well, I think that's a, a wonderful yeah, question, that, question that the committee had. This is one of the first oh, questions that, this, no, but it's what we, we were hoping that someone would ask it hopefully <laughs> for the <laughs> end. <laughs> because what you just described is it is such a, com it is such a contentious and complicated topic 
that we had hoped to leave it a little bit toward the end. But I think it's valid. There may be a lot of people in the audience who may be wondering what are some of the differences between these terms. Could we briefly yeah. give a general account without engaging in a, in a, in a terrible debate? To, you know, <laughs> this right. Right. discuss <laughs> Well, you can go first. We're gonna have fun with this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Well, I, in my own experience, having having been born and raised in Bogota, Colombia, I felt I started as a Colombian artist, and migrating to the U.S., I came in as a Colombian artist, Colombian person, Colombian citizen, and remain in that kind of place of migration, of movement, for a space of time. And I think that that gets transformed by migration as you, as you take in the language, the culture. And I remember at some point thinking to myself, come on. I am here, and this is, I'm a Latina artist. I'm so influenced by all of these other cultural movements. Uh, I'm so much more open to these other ideas that, that there is a transformation, even though I was, and I feel much more, we were having a little discussion about this, I feel so much more kinship with everybody else of, of Latin American origin, born here or born in any, in Argentina or Chile or, or, or Mexico. Or, and, and so I think that art is, ends up being expressed aesthetically, that art that is, that is under the umbrella of the US. Mm -hmm. And I think you see it in literature. Yeah. So you call that Latino? That transition from being Colombian? I call it that way. American? I end up calling it that way because it's under, I mean, the term is US. It's under the umbrella of the US. I mean, right, in, right. In, in, in nobody in Latin America, in any country, would say I'm Latinx. Right, right. If you're in Colombia, you're a Colombian. Right, right. If you're Mexico, you're. you're you're Mexican, you're, you're Peruano, Argentino. I wouldn't say I'm not the X. Right, or the X, but. Right, the term is used here <laughs> in the US. Right, yeah. right, right. You know, our challenge is how do we work together as one as a Latino? I want to pass out a, a brochure of, of this festival that I was a major co founder of, of you know, a theater where I got all Latino. I got the three top Latino uh, arts of the city work together. We formed a new entity. An entity helps give money to you know, groups in our city where theater is. So three not for profits, when we do not for profits, we'll have to fight people that are not for profits. And you know, everybody's money for the festival. Very friendly. My concern is that I am first and foremost a Mexican, and then I'm Latino. I'm proud to do both. My worry is that if we become Latinos first, we will lose individuality. And I don't know how we survive culturally two generations down. Because you know, our language goes away. It will go, you know, two, three generations from now, you know, our children, our grandchildren, whatever, are not be speaking Spanish, let's be serious. Okay? You know, religion is changing dramatically. In fact, if there's a big change in Latin America that's been, you know, the evangelization that's been going on. Chiapas in Mexico is the first stage going to have less Catholics than more Catholics. That's a phenomenon. And this Puerto Rico is a spirit that. So what's gonna bind us together? It's gotta to be, you know, as people, we need our culture, our individuality. Latin America has 20 beautiful countries. And I sometimes feel that people think it's, an, it's not enough to mention Puerto Rico, you have to be the Latino thing, it's like a right. safe, right. safe thing. And that really bothers me because every culture is, is a point. I was right now at the Latino Museum and they have a textile show in Guatemala. Guatemala has the best textiles on my hand in Latin America. Could be wrong, I'm Mexican, and they have the best, they have the best textiles. So about yeah. Colombia Gold, you know, ancient Columbia, the best gold, it, the art was by Columbia. So we all have great cultures. And, and if we don't, I was saying that I was in Chiapas uh, a month ago, I almost cried because this person told me that, been, that there's this language, you felt the 40 people talking over it. The language is recorded, safe, only 40 people calling. Uh, you know, I can talk the language, it's gonna be gone. To me, the greatest thing human beings have done is culture. You know, filling your full hands, 
right now? I say, so what if you don't break? Oh my God, this is a hard question. The only answer we have is culture, man. That's what makes it. So we have these beautiful cultures. Let's be servant and still work together. My thing probably with the Latinx, there was, there was a need for new work. I just don't know why they didn't pick, you know, an indigenous word. Have, or a Spanish word. At this time in which we in the tech were speaking Spanish, why do we pick an English word? If we pick an English word, then we have Latin. Why do we need the X? When I first said it, that was a joke. And people thought, you know, they all kind of commented. So, and, and when I told my word, it's, it's when folks thought, well, if you don't use that term, then you're anti LGBT, anti woman. My institution has done more for women art than any other institution I know in the country, except for the ones that seem in Washington. And the LGBT, BT stuff, Q, we were doing it before the mainstream was doing it. And in my community at that time, it was very hard mm -hmm. to be pro LGBTQ. So the stuff that if you don't use, you know, the word, you know, the word of the accident, then you're a bad guy. to this that policy. But get back to I think the important things. How do we work together? I'm very proud to be Latino, but still keep an individuality. I want a win-win situation. I don't want to eat a war. I may even be greedy, but I think we can do both. Because I am an American too. I want to be American too. We have a lot of identities. I'm a male. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm an uncle, we can have a lot of identities. So why can't I have a cake and too? Why can't we work together as Latinos, support each other, but still keep it in the I don't see how that's controversial kind of device. That was my question. Isn't it detrimental to be branded as Latino artists instead of American artists? Well, this is, uh, yeah, no, no, okay. um, well, that's a false dichotomy. Uh, number one, and I, I like—I don't know how else to say this other than um, no, I don't really like that. Sorry. I, uh, no, I just want to repeat something that it said at the the Latino Art Now conference all the damn time, which is Latino art is American art. And this is the thing, like you know, I was looking at our little cup of flags, and um, we don't have a New Mexican flag. We don't. Do we have an American flag in there? It's, it's the Latin American part. Right, because this is the part of me that's sort of like, wait a minute, aren't we part of Latin America? Like, I, you know, this is why I like Latinx quite a bit. Like, and it's totally self-serving. I, like, I, I'm, I'm being self-serving. Um, <laughs> I still like it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm half Hispanic, half white. I'm from New Jersey. My family's been in New Mexico since God knows when. We don't know, but we know it's been hundreds of years. To the extent that we don't actually have any idea what the hell anybody is. There's some misto of everything that was once on a boat that went to Mexico that colonized and then started walking north. And so the X for me, and this is where I think we're all falling into a really easy, dangerous trap, is that we're trying to define it. And we're trying to do so conclusively. And it's really, um, that's where Karen, I think, nailed it right in the head, right? It's a movement, not a moment. This isn't a now thing. We're not trying to fix it. And I think the notion of defining it is a really, like you were saying before, you know, like, oh, kind of almost like a fascistic, modernist approach. And we're neither fascistic or modernist, I would like to think. So we ought to embrace the X as a, a sort of floating signifier into which we can project possibilities, right? Like, I've been taking notes. Um, because I'm trying to learn, and because I, frankly, I love the idea we don't know and we'll never know, because like, right, what's the X part of an LGBTQ plus movement? Is the X, and I'm saying this because we're in Omaha, and we should like this. Not the X is important, not a hell of a long distance from here. I like the notion of the X as a, as a signifier of self-determination, right? It's an escape from colonized mindsets. Um, and then, um, Adrian Zavala, who I, I love more than she probably knows, you know, talked about the X as a placeholder for anyone allied with the Global South. Then Christian said to me, be careful, that the notion of the Global South might be a recolonizing of the X colonizing. <laughs> so just watch, watch yourself. But in having told me that, it made me reflective in a way that I think the X encouraged us to be. And then Josh Franco had a million different, you know, the X can be erasure. The X can be a destination on a map. The say X, the X marks the spot. The, yeah, right. Um, you know, he's very literally saying the X marks the spot. You know what the X is? The X is hidden treasure we're about to uncover. That's the best. That's the best. I thought that was really powerful. That's the best you know, the X is about sort of potential reward in a way. Um, so, Adrian, you, you kind of mentioned that there, you had a, a, a canned response, like something that could be it. Yeah. So, that was it. Um, so, okay. Can, All right. Sure. Um, <laughs> no, just that I've been trying to collect everybody's. Different definitions of the X because right. we're, we're like, um, you said this the other day, we're like in a tombola. 
You know what I mean? Uh -huh. There's a series of balls bouncing around, each of which has an X definition drawn on it. And some days you pull the one that's useful, some days you win, some days you pull the one that isn't on your card, and you lose. But the idea that we've got possibilities bouncing off of each other is pretty exciting to me. Because it, it puts light on the darkness of our ignorance, right? Also, for the like, art, at the risk of sounding stupid, like, can we define art? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> but it's like, why are we asking ourselves to do we, Did they have dinner brought to us? <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in, in about a minute, could, could we give a brief definition of how we can see the notion of but you know, I want to say something. Like, I want to say something. As the only person who's not from Nebraska yeah, here, I'm not from Nebraska. Oh no, but who works in Nebraska? Okay. Oh, yeah. Don't put me there. Oh, but you have people here who are. I've got it. Her car is the white one outside. No, I. But I. To me, when I when I come home, it's my fourth time back from Omaha. I think you guys have done a lot of things right, and um, you call it, you know, art not conference. You mentioned it. You and the people have mentioned it. They just had a conference last year in Houston. Yeah. They're looking for a place to host it. Okay. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But I think Omar needs something to put it on the, on the map. And I know, you know, people saying he should just shut up. But I do think, I think Omar needs something. And I think if you can, and the last one in Houston was amazing. I didn't go, I have to remember. The one before Chicago, I go chair, the people said it was the best one. When I heard about Houston, they did the best one by far. Women did an amazing job. I think should be happy to talk to you, but I think if all the cultural institutions work together to bring that conference here, it will be super, super great. It will be a hell of a work, and you hate my guts, but I think, I really think it will be good for Omaha. You sometimes need to take a challenge right. and run with it. No, you're entirely right. I'm just in recovery from administration, so the idea of doing that. <laughs> no, don't, I just said you. I said, you know, you have other administrations now. I think in the long term, we put Omar on the map I more. Right. I think there'll be more money coming to Omar. I think more artists will notice you. I think the artists will be seen. It's a win-win situation. It's raising the money and having to work here and off. That's the challenge. But we have a big team. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, because yes. everybody's like, oh, I don't want to do it. I mean, LA said it, New York said it, Chicago said it. It's time for the place. I think Omar will be very, I, I think funders would like that. Just throw it out there before we run out of time. I'm sorry. No, we're taking note of all of this. We have it on video and for the Of course. That's what I want to say. I'm done, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, since uh, well, I guess we don't want to talk to, uh, about art per se, I do have a, a question that might seem anecdotal for all four of you, but it came from students, and I think it might have important sociological implications, especially for younger students. And, uh, and that question is, is for each of you. Would your parents support it in your decision to pursue a career in art? And this is a question that younger students at UNO had for the panelists who were involved in inviting the four of you. And they were curious as to, you know, and you talked about obstacles that students face, or sometimes the benefits and the assets that students might face in their trajectory. And this was a, a question that some of the students had for the four of you is, would your parents support it in your decision to pursue a career in art? Why would they give them the choice? That I remember is like my parents were given a choice. Yeah. I was studying art history. That was the end of the debate. Mm -hmm. It was one phone call, it was three sentences long. I'm gonna study art history. What do you do with that? Don't worry, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess that's maybe my luxury of having supportive parents. Maybe that's how they were incredibly supportive, but it certainly wasn't a debate. Right. And I'm curious as to why this is the gen all right, this is the Gen X are being really shitty towards millennials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why do you listen to your parents so much? What are you doing holding your life choices accountable to their desires for you? Like maybe that. Money? Maybe, I mean, maybe yeah, that is the answer. Yeah. But I, I think though that one of the things that we have to talk about, that's a form of hostage taking. If your parents are going to retract their support for your education based on what you intend to study, that's a, Adrian, unfair. We know, we know that there are families that are heavily in debt sure. to trying to put their kids to college. So yes. I mean, like, I would moderate the expression, right? Because it's, it seems like right now in America, uh, sending someone to college is a multi-generational effort yes. that puts at risk maybe the 
later years of the previous generation. So I mean, they, that's why. No, I understand that. You know, so um, it's kind of like it's it's different, right? But I mean, I, I understand that. Like, I don't mean to deny that, but I don't support the notion that the students should be contained in their ambition for fear of what impact it may have elsewhere. I think that that's uh, unfortunately unfair to see. But there's something else, and, and when we go to schools with, uh, and talk to students, we talk right. to students who will be first generation of college, sure. whose parents, if they finish high school, it's, it was a big thing, most right. of them didn't finish elementary school. Right. Right. So in a culture where being in charge of your parents at some point in your life, mm -hmm. it's key. So if you go into our history, and I know the argument of, oh, yes, you will be making money instead of law, mm -hmm. instead of you know, medicine, mm -hmm. it has a, a, it means some soul searching, right? It means that they're not gonna be able to provide their parents with better years when they're done working in the, in the meat packing, right? right? So it's something else there. Sure, right? but is that not also indicative of a broader social problem where in, uh, the needs of the elderly aren't necessarily being attended to by the broader social fabric and we're placing that on individual citizens in an unfair way? I mean, like, I, I know you're right, but at the same time, like, you're describing my dad, who left home to go to college and, you know, um, face those kinds of questions and succeeded. So I, uh, I just don't want to deny people their freedoms when they can have them. How much do you think you have to pay for college so, as opposed to no, the cost of right. tuition? So right. that, that is a key thing, you know? But, so that we can, but yeah, but the question, of, sorry. No, I was going to say not everyone has to spend forty thousand dollars a year on school either. I'm, you know, there are there are other ways of, yeah. of doing sure. it. If you really want to pursue art or art history, community college has some great opportunities. Of, you know, across the board, you don't have to go to Notre Dame. You don't have to go to Holy Cross. Right. You go to UNO and get uh, get a Buffett grant. Right. There's something else, and but in the case of Carlos, the question should be different. Is what did your children think when you decided to go into art? See, you know, I'm I'm a history teacher. I was a, and I was an administrator, counselor. I worked with, with, with kids and gangs. I dealt with incest cases, abuse cases. I didn't know mo so much, not, you know, not like nice things in the world. No, my kids were very supportive of me doing the museum. And they were very, very, very supportive. Uh, they don't like the fact that I get attacked a lot because I have a big mouth. <laughs> but they're very, they're very proud of the fact that I made this choice. Uh, I think it was it was very important. But you want to comment about tuition? When I went to the college way back, 1775 at UIC University of Chicago, my tuition was six hundred sixty-six dollars a year. You know, you know, state's number. Believe it or not, and I got a grant to do it. Now it's always an opportunity. I went to school that was very racist. I hated it. When I got my diploma, I couldn't believe it. I'm out of here, you know. My kids got straight A's from the top schools, and my son's to uh, you know loan that just paid off two years ago. My daughter, six months ago, I remember this, she has a law degree as a practice law. She was a not-for-profit. She's been paying hers. But it's incredible that I've seen in my life that these were great students. I was a great student. I would cut a lot of classes. Of, I got to go today. <laughs> I did enough to get by and everything. And then I became a high school teacher. I thought there was a better way to be a high school teacher, so I became a teacher. But I do think that this cost of education is also a way to control our young people. Because it's a, you know you can't speak up too much oh when, yeah. when when you're owing all this money, right. you know. Right. Right. And so I do think we have to have more discussions about whether we have free tuition or reduced tuition. But kids cannot be graduate. I mean, can be eight hundred thousand dollars like that. That's crazy. And community college should be an answer. But most community colleges are not that good. In Chicago, they're not that good. Sure. That's that is the answer. You know, you go to community college, then graduate to to, to university. But, but I know that's that's the dream. Like the yeah, no, but that's the dream. I agree with you. Yeah. It, it's not practical today. It just is. Yeah. Just yeah. being honest. Yeah, but the true issue is goes beyond to the cost of tuition. It's the income gap. Income gap. The the, the, the extreme differences between yeah. the. Mm -hmm. I think coming from a student, coming from a student that. Be quiet. Why are you here? <laughs> I'm starting to look criminal justice. And my parents were like, ah, that's okay, criminal justice, you can be a police officer, you can be something like that. My third year here, I, I changed to art. They were heartbroken. And I think it, I didn't want to do it for the fact that 
they came over for a better life and they had this image in their head. They're gonna be a doctor, they're gonna be a lawyer, they're gonna make something that's money that you're gonna be. They're not gonna work as hard as they did to get where we're at. And so demolishing that dream that they have is like so much pressure in a sense. Mm. So that's why you don't wanna, you're kinda, I wanna say failing them to be happy. So it's like, it's a sense of like, where do I go? Do I be happy and disappoint my parents? Or do I go with my parents and not be happy myself? Like I know plenty of students who do that, who are in a career that they hate, hate, but that they know that their parents are happy for them. So it's like, it's kind of a sense of like, I my parents are Mexican and I was born here, but when I go to Mexico, I'm not Mexican because I have an accent, because yeah. I do all this other things. But when I'm here, I'm an American because I look Mexican. So it's like, you don't know where to choose but that was like, like, like well, that so that happens though. You're, I mean, what do you do now for a day job? You, you are a communications yes. expert slash study abroad liaison. Yeah. I mean, like you're you're for me like a living example of how that risk can pay off. Take the leap, do the work. And I'm not saying that everybody has that same opportunity, but you're you're standing right here as evidence of the possibility. And to, acting like that's not real is very tragic. I want to talk about your camera club when, when you have a chance to make the direction of, you know, you know, the, you know, the power to be in Mexico, the left, right, and the middle, they always see Mexico as a set of border as lower class people, you know, enter about that kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. But the average in Mexico, they treat you like Mexicans. So do not let the power structure say you're not Mexican. They go to hell. I mean, I'm Mexican. I don't care if anybody believes me. If I think I'm not, I'm crazy. I'm Mexican. So I don't think you should let that stop you from thinking I'm Mexican. Where am I going, Mexican? And if they don't like that, the power structure is going to help. But they don't determine who I am. I determine who I am. I, I wanted to say, you know, this idea that for some reason going into the arts is uh, not economically wise as a decision. I, I think that has to be totally demolished as a, con as a preconceived notion. We hear about business law and medicine. That's it. I mean, look at all the, school, the, the schools within UNO that are producing people who are going into well-paying jobs in the social sciences and all kinds of other fields. Why is it that for some reason art, which as you were mentioning earlier, um, what the, the amount it contributes to the economy, why is the assumption that, that going into the arts is somehow, I think that's what has to be um, scared, challenged. What, sorry, what I, can you clarify your, your, your question? So you're asking why why we have to think that way? That no, it's, the, it's the framing of the question in the first place, that, that okay. the idea that if um, if you major in art, somehow you are not going to have a financially um, stable future. Okay, so as opposed to all these other fields that are producing that are not um, the, you know, the, the classic professions that you hear about, that are uh, talked about in relation to success. I think that, you know, from what I'm hearing, like, uh, um, and others, I, I, I see people who are perfectly successful and, and should, their parents, I would think, would be proud of them, um, and who are, I think would be capable of taking care of their parents and their dotage um, to a certain degree. It's, 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 we have this vision that's been given us of what that kind of caretaking is going to uh, require in the long run. But the reality is most arts people, artists, do not, they, they don't have a career. A lot of them are very successful, a lot of them are not. And you know, there was that old joke, so what do the artists tell the two lawyers? You know, so what do you want with that burger? I mean, it's, the, but that's it's what it is. And so, no, so you that's have to like shape in some way. No, 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 but I'm just saying you have to be strong to be an arts person. Right, that is that's true. That's what I'm saying. Because you have things Because you can be a teacher, it. you can be a teacher. Some, some school teacher is going to hire you. But if you want to be an artist, it means that you're going to have to, you know, you only sit it one day. It is hard to be an artist. It is. That's just being real. So I so 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 I do think you're right. That's the reason we have to change this. We really do this perception. But many artists do not ever have a show. That's just being real. I think Karen, you want to do that? Um, I had like eighty three things to respond to. <laughs> um, I I mean yeah, I just to kind of go off what you're saying. Yeah, you're right. Um, yes, you can have a lucrative. Career. There are plenty of things you can go into that can you know, dovetail into from an arts career, but but the reality is that uh, to your point, there is a huge pay gap, right? And and don't even talk to me about being a woman working in the arts because that's we, we can like go really deep down a rabbit hole with that, right? 
So um, I would never, ever, ever discourage someone from pursuing a degree in the arts, whether they want to go into an artist track, like what, what, whatever that means. And we're using the arts really broadly too. If we wanted to get really specific about it, there are obviously differences within that. Um, but I, I don't, I don't even remember where the thought had started because I had so many kind of ideas pinging off of these. But, but there, there is a pay gap, and it's, it is, it is a question we have to ask. Yeah, it's been handed down high, I and mean, I think about like all of our everyone's progressive hero, Barack Obama, talking about how an artistry degree is the, the least useful degree you can have, and how people were like, oh, don't, "Don't say it, don't say it, sir." But, but he had a point, unfortunately, because it's not going to play out for most people to try to pursue it. You know, the one thing about the arts, it is an unfair world. You know, in sports, for example, okay, like when Michael Jordan, who really isn't the nicest person in the world, he isn't, but you can't deny he's a great basketball player. But there are good arts people who don't make it, good arts people who make it. There are bad artists who don't make it, bad artists who make it. There are colleagues I know who get around as artists, start buying the artwork, they can make it. You know, you know, we can't do that in sports. We can, okay, I'm gonna make right. you the next sure top for, for the Cubs. You can't do it in the art world. It's, 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 it's such a different sphere. And so that comes into play too. So there's a lot of, it, it being, I was talking about early, being an artist is a very great thing because you put your work out there and it's naked and it's there. That takes courage, tremendous courage, I think. Especially when you, you know, it's 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 not easy. So I admire artists a lot. I have no artistic talent, okay? I can talk to God about that. But anyway, no, but, but I gotta get back to the arts was a very unfair place. Man. There are a lot of great artists. I mean, you always go back to Van Gogh, so one pain in his life that. How can you see a Van Gogh? And, his brothers. <laughs> how can you see a Van Gogh and not say, wow? I mean, the art world can be unfair about that. So it is, though, not only is it a hard feeling of job sometimes, but it's not, a, it's not a fair world sometimes. That just being real. But it's also a question too, like, what am I in it for? Um, I didn't sign into this to get rich. I signed into this to be satisfied. Because and I believe to have a rewarding career filled with answer. interesting conversations with interesting people. I get that every damn day. I'd rather be unwealthy and satisfied. When I'm approached with that question of should students go into the arts, should students go to the arts, I say you have to think really carefully about it. What kind of life do you want to lead? And is it, do you wake up every day wanting to do that? Because you have to be passionate about it. I would put myself in that category. I'd put anyone at this table in that category. Because if we didn't wake up every day believing that the work that we do is important, or that it is personally fulfilling in some way, and I, and I think that those two can be mutually exclusive, but I think oftentimes they also come together. Um, you know, none of us would have gone into this. Right. No one goes to their first day of art history 101 since they're like, I can't wait to make my millions as an art historian, <laughs> right? It just doesn't happen. Um, and it never will, you're right. Um, I thought you had two million. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to say, we we're going to try to keep this panel up to about 90 minutes, but we did start a little bit late, so I thought I would give the audience to maybe ask two more questions. I have to go to the I Okay, so, please continue. <laughs> so, 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 so maybe we will have to, to continue with it. Well, thank you so much. So, thank you. Everybody in the press has been really nice to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> If someone has to go, we completely understand. We wanted to give uh, an additional chance for audience members to ask any questions that you might have. How do you think we can get more um, Latinx professors to be in the arts or to just be in school? You just make noise all damn day until they, <laughs> they figure out a way to answer it. I think the unfortunate reality, too, though, is that you have to accept the fact that universities are governed by boards and administrators who are not always oriented towards education. Some days they care more about how many butts are in the chairs and how many things are worth. And so all the effort may not pay off, but being loud, going, knowing, you know, like, oyos exists, our, our history exists, you know, marshalling our forces together. Um, Bad news, I'm back. My, it seems that we leave it five, not my plan. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm back. Bad news, good news. <laughs> um, get, get rich and sponsor a endowed line. I mean, you know, Adrian makes a good point, though. It's, and it's crass, and we don't talk about it as much as we should, but so much comes down to dollar bills, um, regardless of what kind of organization you're in, in academia and in nonprofits. You don't have the money for it, and Carlos, you talked about this. If there aren't, if there aren't funders, if there's not money, things don't happen. And 
that comes from a lot of different places um, in terms of like how, how that funding ends up in your hands. Um, but you know, I think we need to be more transparent about how much money actually does. Right. And I appreciate that you touched on that earlier. You know, one challenge that we don't really talk about because it's uncomfortable, but you know, our professional community do not give the not-for-profits. Sandy has that from our community too. Which is interesting because, you know, you know, you know, we send back more money back to, to you know to people in Mexico, you know, than oil or church businesses from Mexico. But that's coming from working class people, right. not from our professionals. But you see that from our community and you see that in the American community, you see Latino community of our professional, they really don't do a good job of giving. And we have all these programs on how to be, you know, you know, you know, leader. And I always say, can you talk about this project? Have a part of this, this whole thing, and nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah. It's a serious issue where professionals have to start for. You know, so maybe professional forward. remittances for university faculty, perhaps? You know, the professional sending remittances. I'm just saying, it's, we have enough people now, <laughs> doctors, lawyers, you know, we have enough people are making some six figures. They need to give something back. Not just in the arts, across the yeah. board. Mm -hmm. That's an issue. They do. Well, well, they they do. I, think, oh, I think we have to give a little bit of credit well, to the right. fact that Omaha is, has an incredible philanthropic no, we, you know, And we that's one of the reasons I wanted to come here. Yeah, you know, we have a board that has, you know, give or get $10,000. Mm -hmm. But we are unique in that in Chicago. And I know there's a lot of people out there like money. You need to give. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't make you a hero, nothing. You should do it because it's the right thing to do. That's simple. But I love to hear, you know, um, Brigitte McLean Shu, who is the visionary that started this institution, once had a class of mine where we were talking about this, about donating and philanthropy and such. And she looked at a, a room full of students who were like, I don't make enough money to do anything. So I can do the magic of 10 bucks. Don't drink two cups of coffee this week. I'll take that 10 bucks from you and I'll feed and educate kids. You know, like, uh, and it never occurred to me because like, we, we often get this sort of notion that philanthropy involved like Bill Gates quantities of money. But every penny really does help. And so you're right, like an incremental growth is as important as the $200,000 yeah. So everybody, like, save your couch money and put it in the bucket. It helps. But I think, and it, I mean, to my, my previous point, that there's a Warren Buffett effect here of trickle down mm -hmm. for, for philanthropy. And just look at the numbers. The stats on Omaha Gives Day are mind blowing. It's, it's, yeah, it's the number of dollars raised, but the number of unique donors, people who are giving the amount of 10 and $25. Um, and it, it makes, it, yeah, exactly. But you're exactly right. Um, so I think that, that makes a difference. And, I'm, and I, I, I hope that the younger generations are like, makes me feel old when I say that. But like, you have to, like, you give some of the money that you have. You know, we all work in the arts. We're not, like I said, we're not being what? Well, I'm just saying, like, think of the economy we just have created for the next generation. So, you know, like, I really feel it when students say things like, I gotta pick between philanthropy and food. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's tricky. But the, to the point about not buying, you know, $6 yeah, yeah, yeah. coffee every single day. Right. There, you know, yes, there's a line. Do you think, with Rick mentioning to, you know, or highlighting perhaps if students were to do it to administration, that the, the Latino student population is the fastest growing demographic at the university, mm -hmm. so there could be costs associating with not hiring a faculty yeah, totally. along those lines mm -hmm. to, to meet mm -hmm. the, you know, right. to have the proper supply to meet the demand. I mean, yeah. uh, at some points, uh, even the, the logic of the all administrative neoliberal corporate university might end up uh, hindering its own profit making. You know, like, why would you go somewhere where you don't see yourself? Right, right. So that's when, you know, studies have proved that over and over. And then you see yourself, not, not as a security guard, not right. working as a janitor, in a professional job, or your artwork on the wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've studied that to death, and you're right. That's the same. Do we have one more question from the audience? Exchange between who, though? I guess, I mean, any kind of like you know, sister cities or, you know, um, I feel like in the small amount of time I've been in Omaha, and I moved kind of from, well, various parts of Texas, but San Antonio was a home base for a while. And so they naturally have this, you know, Latinx community ready to go, you know? And um, there's, that, that takes time to develop, but also the connection with your family those ancestors you know, that you know, you develop these this this rich heritage, this rich culture that you can then feel empowered by, and I I guess I'm just curious if there's any.
potential to start talking about that even or if it's, I don't know, if that's... Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, Omaha is part of the Citrus Cities program. It has a one in, in Japan, Chisoka, one in Germany. Jalapa Mexico. Jalapa Mexico. Jalapa Mexico. Mexico. I'm just looking it up. There's yes. a, you Jalapa, have China, you have a lot. In Jalapa, we are doing, you know, doing things with Jalapa. It has a public health study abroad program. It's going to have Spanish. Spanish. That's a great thing. And, uh, and education. And education. Can but, we but, huh? Can we join in on that? <laughs> you mean art? Like, can the art people get in on this? So, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. The yes. art is making. Like, yeah, of course. And for example, we, we have at OIS, we have a study abroad program in Peru mm -hmm. that next year is going to be on sustainable tourism. And we keep asking ourselves, should we invite people in the community to go take this class with us? Right? right. right? So it's something else. It's not about art. It's about, it's, well, the oh, will go to Machu Picchu. There's, there's likely. going to be art. In right. The world. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but tourism is the number one industry in the world. And what's a big factor? Arts and culture. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are options like that. And we, at least we're trying to work on more of it. A quick question. Um, so do you guys think that Latino, Latinx, Latin American artists, when they're in the United States, have are sort of restricted into what they make because they feel like they need to represent overrepresent their heritage or their culture rather than just simply being an artist? I think that's is it's probably a great question. Yeah. yeah. I have the same question. As the artist. Yeah, as the artist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oi, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's probably a pressure to to represent a. Um, You know, to represent the ethnicity, the cultural. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, not really. But there was a funny moment this week, though, when Adela Fernandez was in town, where she, you know, um, she's a Latina. Um, yeah, from Cuba. Right? From Cuba. Yeah, she's Cuba. And so it was one of these moments where she was like, I'm tired of people asking me to make art that looks like I'm from, you know, mm -hmm. a different culture. I, I make art that is of myself. It doesn't always look like what you want me to look like. It was really poignant. Yeah, yeah I want to take this again. I think that there is, via art school, I think something that that uh, Latino artists have used to enter the mainstream has been more of a kind of international aesthetic that allows them to be able to participate. And I think if there's anything, is the pressure to kind of get in with the program. I think like a, a regionalism, like something really rooted in some, in, in, uh, in something very regional. Let's say you are from, you know, a, 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 if you are an indigenous person from, uh, I'm going to use Colombia, my, my own country. Let's say if you want to use uh, Wayu imagery from the north of La, La Guajira, mm -hmm. in order to penetrate the system, it has to it has to use the structures of contemporary aesthetics. Mm -hmm. You know the painting of the mochila or the actual mochila won't do it mm -hmm. so that in itself it's it's still an overriding dominant colonial structure that takes place mm -hmm. and i think that's that regionalisms are kind of in some way disappearing because of that you know, yeah, we so have the, i would say that those are the pressures we don't yeah. have to start lunch. I think, I think as an artist, if you want to be a jazz musician, a classical musician, you're Latino, there's no problem with that. 
you should do what you want to do. You want to do ballets and Pocolico? Ain't nothing wrong with that. The only problem I find is, is, is when you think you're being our form of the ultimate, then I have a problem with you. But you should be doing whatever you want to do. And if you're you know, you know, a visual artist, and you're invited by here to do it, you know, you know, at your place, you're invited here, you should show it both places. What's the problem? My only concern is when you think, oh, this is the place to be because it's your country. Then I have that's what this means. Well, you do whatever you want to. You, you yeah, make that's a little no, bit the topic it. because let's say you're in New York and you and you and you listen to the Peruvian musicians, you know, playing their flutes. They are not allowed to enter into the places of high art. No, they should be able to. They should be able to. That's, that's why I'm saying it's utopic. They're, they they there is a huge divide. And we that have to does, change, not, does not permit that, and that is at the basis racism. Yeah. Yeah. No, it all goes back to racism. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. But I do think it's important that you know we should struggle to why don't they perform, you know, at top places? You know, why did you know yeah. why are they in the street? Why can't they go to, you know, you know, you know, you know Carnegie Hall? Why can't they? I think these are things we need to change, and that's I think we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There needs to be change in this mm -hmm. country, radical change. Not reform, radical change. Can I ask a question about the question? Because I'm curious, because I think I'm projecting. Um, it, the way the question was formed made me wonder if you are thinking of Latinx artists as inherently non-American. Because I think that the longer I travel this landscape, the more I'm convinced that America needs to be conceived of as part of Latin America when it was appropriate. And uh, you know, after the long conference and spending time in Mexico and like, you're amusing, and you're like, I keep thinking like 1848, right. you know what I mean? Right. Like right. huge chunks of America were still Mexico until 1848, right. and right. by anything <coughs> semantics still are. Right. And so we need to sort of uh, at least come to terms with the moments where we are already of Latin America and mm -hmm. not behave as if we are extraterrestrials to one another. But see, but just the word the word American, everybody in Latin America is American. Yeah. Right. right. We're all right. American. Right. Right. So I think it's not thinking that we're Latin Americans, thinking that people in Latin America are part of America. Right. That's what we should call it. Look at it. I, I like that you're pointing out though, that words matter. I mean, this oh, is they do. I, they do. I, when preparing for this, I wrote that phrase down at least three or four times. Um, and, it, and it goes back to a lot of things. Sorry, I know we're running over, but I, this is something I kind of wanted to get in. Actually, I, I wrote this down earlier. Um, the phrase, for example, female artist, makes me want to claw my eyes out. Um, because you never say, well, he's a male artist. Right, right. And, um, you know, in the same way that, like, we're moving away from, and we should be moving away from saying, well, he makes black art. But what does that even mean? Right. So what does it mean to make Latinx art? You are someone, you are an artist, and you are Latinx. And maybe it impacts your work, and maybe it doesn't, just kind of dovetail off of the previous conversation. Um, so, just the specificity of language is something that we, has to be the core of every conversation we have about this, and maybe bursting open those terms a little bit, or simply not using them sometimes, is actually more revolutionary and beneficial than putting labels on absolutely everything. That's true, because you know, there is such a thing as a Chicano art movement. Mm -hmm. There sure. is. But that doesn't mean that that's what fights everybody. No, you have, to, you have to choose a pick mm -hmm. when you use this term. It's important. But it's interesting, you said, I don't know what you said, I don't know exactly what you said earlier, but you said something in my brain. I don't remember what I said, I'm an old guy. It's just cheese brain, but it was like, I, I, my initial, I wanted to speak, say a lot like, but yeah, of course, 20th century aesthetics are Eurocentric and have been the whole way through. And the idea that, you know, a, a, an artist of anything else wouldn't be in some way kind of co-opted by the discourse might be naive. Um, like Nancy's saying, you, know, you have to sort of fall into the aesthetics of the New York scene, and you have to adapt to the expectations of the uh, the critical apparatus. And but so, but it's another way too. The way you are, you know, you know, subversive. You're entering that the right, place where right. they don't want you, and you're making it. You you want to get urinating at these places and say, "This is my territory too, man." So I look at it the other way. I mean, you, you know, which you have a right to say, "This right. is mine." You know, you know, Johnson Museum isn't just the white people. That's what you want it for everybody. So an artist should want to be in there. So you know, he's not being co-opted. He should be. He should be able to be in there and do his thing. If he's allowed to do his thing, right. or if you say this is not what it is, then we have a problem. Right. Then he's being co-opted. But if he's doing an art that he wants and you put him in, 
He should be. He lives in this thing, right? Or he's a good artist. I don't think that's a problem. These are into, you know, darts in Chicago is my, my museum too. So they charge 25 dollars to have to get in, 20 dollars for special exhibits, you know, but it's my museum too. I'm in Chicago, it's my museum too. I have a right to be part of that. Jaws and Collection is free. I know, I was going to do I apologize. They told me this, I forgot to mention that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It is important, yeah. Well, I think on that happy notion of free and inclusive <laughs> museums, this would be a, a good moment to kind of wrap up our discussion. Thank you all for, for your wonderful contributions and for being here. And uh, we really appreciate it. Let's give them a round of applause.